Hello, guys and gals, and this we are going to be reading from this book, The Little Giant Book of Who Done It by Hi Conrad, illustrated by Matt LaFleur. Now, um, I think I've read this book all the way through once, but um, besides that, um, let's see here. But yeah, these are just like little two minute mysteries, and there's quite a few of them in here. And we're going to uh, read through this. And uh, it's a sterling publication. I forget where I got this, but I think I got it from a thrift store. This is um, a list of all the different ones. We're going to get at least part way through this. The song entry song is Alphys from Undertale. And um, this one is going to be Who Killed Santa Claus? And we are going to just get started right away here. It was midnight on Christmas Eve when the maintenance staff at Kimball's came to work in the, des in the deserted department store. When they arrived at the North Pole display, they discovered every child's worst nightmare, the lifeless body of Santa Claus. He was in a, st in a storage room, his head bashed in by the butt end of a forty four revolver. Santa's off-duty name was Rudolph Pringle. That, and that name like that would make me hungry. I'd be hungry for Pringles nonstop. But um, again, that isn't in the story. That's just my personal observation. Sorry about that. Uh, Rudolph Pringle. That's Rudolph's revolver, the manager informed the police. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> he started carrying it after a six-year-old pulled a knife on him. My gosh, what city is that in? A six-year-old would have a knife, much less pull it on a Santa Claus. The manager cleared his throat. Santa's been having a lot of fights with his elves. I know three elves who threatened to kill him. The detective had the murder weapon bagged, then placed it in the center, oh, it on the center of the interview table, right where the suspects would be forced to, oh, there's, there's the three suspects. Um, to look at it, uh, where the, oh, the, yeah. Rudolph Pringle has been murdered, he informed each elf. What do you think about it? Joe Winter shivered and couldn't stop staring at the gun. I know nothing. Some of the guys had trouble with Rudolph, but he was always nice to me. I left the store at nine, right when I clo right when it closed. I was too tired to change, so I wore my costume home. No one said a word on the subway. Rudolph was a pig, snarled Sam Petrie, the second elf. If he pushed me too far, I wouldn't smash his head in. I'd sue. What's the use of a dead Santa when a live one can be made to pay? Robert Goldstein was the smallest elf. On hearing the news, he burst into tears. Last week, Rudolph started a fight. He said I was too slow bringing, bringing in the kids. He slapped me on the head and called me all sorts of names, but I didn't kill him. The detective called in his assistant. Well, we have our killer, he said with a smile. All I have to do is use a little psychology. Who done it? Well, this one is a little bit confusing. I think it's all in the phrasing. I'm not sure. Well, let's check out the answer, I think. Yeah, okay. It said 380-something, I think. Uh, 386, I believe, was the, uh, an the answer. These are all alphabetical, by the way. Uh, I don't think it goes all the way up to 386. I think I got, the, I got it wrong. Okay, I got it wrong. Oh, what number was it? Oh, 348. 386, what was I thinking? 348. Uh, so have you figured it out? I didn't. Anyways, it says, Sam Petrie, by leaving the gun on the table, the detective made the unspoken implication that Rudolph had been shot. And yet this, yet in Sam's statement, he mentioned the fact that Rudolph had been hit. The only way Sam could have known that was if he had done it himself. After work on Christmas Eve, Sam stayed behind to turn in his elf costume and pick up his paycheck. He and Rudolph got into one last argument Rudolph threatened Sam and pulled a um, Sam and pulled a gun. In a fit of rage, Sam tore the gun from Rudolph's hand and bashed him over the head. So we have that one. Now next we have this one. Agent Brown's shining moment. A black Cadillac tore around the busy street corner, barely slowing as it approached the steps of the courthouse. The tented passenger side window rolled down, and the a semi-automatic handgun poked its barrel out. Paul A. Gillespie, mob informant and, fe and federally protected witness, stood frozen in his tracks. His worst fears looked like a, de a definite possibility. 
Polly's FBI bodyguards threw themselves on top of him, but not before two shots erupted and Polly took had taken a bullet in the shoulder. The Cadillac screeched across two lanes of traffic, but it made the mistake of, of turning left down an alley and getting stuck behind a double parked delivery van. The two hitmen scrambled out of the out and raced away, right into the arms of four off duty officers. Having heard the shots and sirens, the officers grabbed the running men and held held on and and held on until the FBI caught up. Special Agent Brown was new to the unit and was always given the boring, inconsequential job jobs. In this case, he was told to clear the Cadillac out of the alley so that normal traffic could resume. Brown adjusted the rearview mirror, backed the car out, and drove it around to where the, his colleagues were Mirandizing their suspects. Mirandizing. I like that word. Brown stood and watched. One of the handcuffed men was tall, lean, and solemn. The other was a good five inches shorter. Agent Brown's height. Oh, Agent Brown's height. Large but short. He spoke ad- animatedly, gesturing freely with his hands. Agent Fordney, director of the unit, seemed exasperated. They ditched the gun back in the alley, F- Fordney growled. They ditched their gloves back there, too. All right, boys, I'm going to ask you again. Which one of you was the shooter? Not me, said the large, short man. Not me, said the lean, sullen one. Agent Brown smiled. He, he had his chance to impress his boss. I know who the shooter was, he said softly. Who was the shooter and how did Agent Brown know? Well, I'm going to give you time to um, figure that out while I look for page at page 301. So, um, yeah, I never get these, by the way. I mean, I never figure out who it is, but anyways, or what reason, because they're usually something subtle. Okay, all right, right here. It says, uh, here, eh. It says, um, when Agent Brown got into the Cadillac, he had to adjust the rearview mirror. That meant that the previous driver had been significantly different in height. Since the shorter mobster was closer to Brown's own height, he knew the taller man had to be the driver. Therefore, the shorter man was the shooter. Okay. So there's that. Okay. Now we are to Super Bowl Madness. Vince McCormick was a huge, was a big, angry slug of a man, just a month shy of retirement. On Super Bowl Sunday, his two sons, Vince Jr. and Sonny, came over, as usual, to watch the game. As kickoff time approached, the boys were in the kitchen helping their mother prepare the snacks. Jr. heated up nachos in the microwave while Sonny poured the bags of potato chips and pretzels in the bowls. Marie McCormick was mixing the ice and ginger ale and rye together in tall glasses. Make sure mine is strong enough, came her husband's growl from the living room. Junior saw a bruise on his mother's arm. Did he do that to you? He asked Marie. Ask. Marie didn't answer. What do you do uh, What do you do when he retires and hangs around all day, Sonny asked. It'll only get worse. No one in the family gets... No one in our family gets divorced, Marie said firmly. Oh, dear, I forgot which one, which one is your father's... Taste the, taste the highballs, Sonny. Third one. Uh, oh. Sonny tasted the drinks, nearly choking on the third one. It's about as twice as strong as the other. <laughs> it's about as twice as strong as the other. Give it to me, Vince was suddenly standing right behind them, grabbing for his drink. Make me come in, make me, making me come in here, he muttered dangerously. Sonny carried in the snack bowl while Junior took in the nachos, just in time for the kickoff. Marie followed with the other drinks. All four sat around the TV munching on the snacks and sipping their drinks. It was nearly the end of the first quarter when Vince Sr. held up the, his empty glass. Get me another, he, be- he bellowed. Marie was in the kitchen working on the refill when, he, when she heard a gasp, and then a moan. She returned to find her husband crumpled in his e- easy chair dying. A strong, fast-acting poison, the homicide detective said. Two to five minutes, and yet they all claim to be eating the same thing. They're obviously lying, covering each, covering up for each other. Not necessarily, the sergeant ventured. It could have happened just the, the way they said. How could Vince have been poisoned, and who could have done it? Well, um, I don't know. This one, okay, I think it was 340, I think. 
Um, I, I kind of remember this one. Ah, here, Super Bowl Madness. It says here, The poison couldn't have been in the, the communal snack food. It must have been in the victim's drink. But Sonny tasted the, his father's highball right before the game and showed no ill effects. The only possibility left was the ice. Marie had added poisoned ice cubes to her husband's glass. The fact-acting poison melted as he drank, killing him almost a half an hour after his wife had mixed the deadly highball. While Vince lay gasping for air, his wife was in the kitchen cleaning the glass of all, of any telltale residue. Brilliant, really. Anyway, so let's uh, go and do another one. We're only 11 minutes in. Uh, long distance. Um, where was it? Uh, the van... And how, okay. We are ready for um, the vanishing love token. I wonder what this is about. Is he sticking his hand down that dog's throat? That's interesting. Okay. The Valentine's Day party was a tradition. Um, each year, Henry and Bitsy Vanderkleef invited their friends into their Park Avenue home. After a, a sumptuous dinner, the couple retired to the drawing room. The men drank port and the women drank champagne, and each couple exchanged love tokens. This year, George Epson outdid himself, presenting his wife with a ruby necklace. The, the women sighed enviously while the men mentally added up the cost and wondered how their wives would react to their own less extravagant gifts. When Henry's turn came, he told Bitsy to close her eyes and led her over to the window. When Bitsy opened her eyes, she saw the billboard and gasped. To Bitsy, the most beautiful woman in the world, love Henry. You don't know how much trouble it was to get was getting a billboard put up on Park Avenue, Henry said. The women sighed again while the men mentally added and wondered. George Epson the first noticed oh George Epson was the first to notice the missing necklace. Stolen, he gasped and holding up an empty jewel, jewel box. Nobody leave the room. Everyone assured everyone else that there couldn't possibly be a thief among them. N not them. The necklace must have fallen or had been mislaid. Systematically, they searched the room. There was nothing in the empty champagne bottle, nothing in the thick Persian carpet. The crystal decanter set was in place, and all the containers filled to the top with whiskey, port, and bourbon. The glasses were examined, as were the folds of the red-tied black curtains flanking the locked windows. They even inspected the red crystal chandelier. What about the dog and cat, Henry asked. The butler quickly rounded up both pets, stuck his fingers down the throats, and then checked out their favorite hiding places. In desperation, all the guests permitted themselves to be searched. Still nothing. Police, in Police Inspector Clyde, the poorest member of the gathering, finally spoke. It does look like, uh, like robbery, he said reluctantly. And while I don't know who took the ruby necklace, I can tell you where it is now. Where is the necklace, and how did Inspector Clyde know? Now, this is on page 346. 346. Ah, uh, here. It says, Inspector Clyde had noticed a full decanter of port. Since the men had been drinking port, the, the container should have been at least part, partly empty. With all his wealthy friends wearing, watching, Clyde took the decanter to the bathroom sink, poured out the costly port, and revealed the red necklace inside. The butler eventually confessed. While everyone's attention had been diverted by the billboard, he lifted the necklace and deposited it into the decanter. The crystal pattern and the color of the port made the presence of the necklace undetectable. Okay, let's read another one. Let's see, we're on page 20. Oh, yes, here we are. Okay, next we have Friends at the Office. Homicide Detective Gibson was visiting his accountant in a small, seedy office building when he heard noises coming from above. First there were angry voices, then came a scream followed by a heavy thud. Gibson excused himself and raced up the stairs. On the next floor, he found an open door. Wiley Klein, a low-rent lawyer, lay on the floor of his office, a switchblade knife sticking out of his chest. Gibson called in the murder uh, and it immediately found himself assigned to the case. When his partner arrived, the detectives examined the office. Not far from the victim's hand was a, a half-smoked cigarette. On the floor beside it was a turned-over wastebasket, a cheap lighter, and a black notepad. On the desk, they noticed a telephone, a pen, a shot glass smelling of bourbon, and an ashtray filled with cigarette butts. 
up and burned matches. Okay. It's funny how none of the neighbors poked their heads out, Gibson observed. Let's go talk to them. The floor contained three other offices. The first door they knocked on produced Helen Hurley, a massage therapist. She told them she was relaxing between appointments. I didn't hear a thing, she claimed, pointing to the stereo headphones she'd she just removed. You say Wiley was murdered? I'm not surprised. He must have cheated everyone he'd ever met. The second office belonged to Jackson Codd, an artist. In one hand, he held a paintbrush, and in the other, an unlit cigar. Surely, sure, I heard the scream, but I was right in a moment of inspiration. Besides, you hear all sorts of things in this building. Jackson held out his cigar. Either of you fellas got a light? Behind door number three was Lionel Wafer, a chiropractor who, who between who was who, um, ah, a chiropractor also between appointments. I heard a scream. What happened? Gibson told him. Then he he asked Lionel why why he was holding an ice pick. Oh, I'm defrosting. Lionel said as he returned to to his old ice laden refrigerator in the corner. Oh, in the corner. You might want a uh, you want a drink or a cigarette. We should celebrate. Klein deserved what he got. Later, detectives compared notes. Well, we definitely got a, su got a suspect, Gibson said. Whom did G um, Gibson, no, Gilson suspect and why? Well, we go to page 316 and we'll find out. I have no idea on this one either. This one is, these are kind of difficult. Uh, friends, Delphi, here we go. Okay, it says, by examining Wiley's ashtray, Gibson concluded that the lawyer had been a smoker and that he lit his cigarettes with matches. The cheap lighter w on the floor by the body was probably left accidentally by Wiley's killer. Jackson Codd smoked cigars, and but didn't seem to have a lighter or matches in his studio with him. That made him the prime suspect. Yep, that's what I was thinking. Okay, so let's... Okay, three sixteen. Okay, I think that we are ready for death of a deceiver. I believe. Hold on. Okay, death of a deceiver. It says Mona Fisher turned and gazed at Jerry sleeping next to her on the plane. Her eyes wandered down to his wedding band. She still couldn't believe she was married to such a catch. Their flight from Acapulco landed late that night. The next morning, February 10th, Jerry Fisher shoveled the snow from the driveway, kissed Mona goodbye, and headed off to work. At 7 that evening, a cleaning woman entered the law offices of Fisher and Dice and discovered the body of Jerry Fisher. He had been stabbed to death, a sharp letter opener still sticking out of his chest. Lieutenant Miller's first unpleasant duty was to interview the young lawyer's widow, Mona. Oh, young lawyer's widow. Mona was distraught. We were only married four months we were only married four months. I never met a man more romantic and honest. Why would anyone want to kill him? Jerry's draw, Jerry's law partner, Kyle Dice, echoed her sen sentiments. Jerry was a man I trusted completely and a darn good lawyer. He was still working when I left, about 6 p.m. I walked across to the health club. I didn't work out, just used the, the tanning bed. I suppose I was jealous of Jerry's great Mexico tan. The lieutenant spent the next hour going through Jerry's papers and discovered that the trusted Jerry Fisher had been skimming money from the law partnership. He also found the phone number of a woman, Gail Lewinsky. They located Mrs. Mrs. Le Miss Lewinsky just leaving the art gallery she managed. The attractive redhead was devastated by Jerry's death and even more devastated to hear that he'd been married. We were together just this afternoon at my apartment. Uh, the louse told me he was single. For two months, he was stringing me along. Oh, stringing me on. I was so sure he was going to propose. Uh, let's see. Lieutenant Miller and his partner showed up to witness Jerry Fisher's autopsy. All three of them had motives, the, partners, the partner whispered as they stared down at the cold, naked, bo uh, at, at the na the cold naked body. The only trouble is they don't know, they they didn't know they had motives. One of them knew, Miller said, and I know which one. Whom did the lieutenant suspect and why? 
Okay, I'm thinking that has to do with the wedding ring. I'm not sure. Okay, 311. Ah. It says here, Death of the Deceiver. Okay. It says here, um, the naked body on the autopsy table held the, the pivotal clue. On Jerry Fisher's ring finger was a tan line just where his wedding ring had been. If he had been... Okay. Uh, Lieutenant Miller pointed it out. When Jerry went over to Gail's apartment, he naturally removed his wedding ring. Unfortunately, he forgot about the tan line. It's winter here, so he never had to deal with this problem before. There's no way Gail could have spent the afternoon with him and not noticed that line. His partner nodded. Let's go back and talk to Miss, Mrs. Lewinsky. Okay, let me pause this for just a sec. And we are ready for another one. This one is called The Party's Over. Tony had promised to help clean up after the party, and Tony was a man of his word. Still nursing a hangover, Tony dragged himself over to Fernando's house. The two men had coffee and walked into the house. Oh, wait. The two men had coffee and walked into the fenced-in yard, not the house, scene of last night's birthday revels. The lawn was strewn with blown-up balloons and bottles and streamers, but after an hour of work, they managed to get it cleaned up. Darn, Fernando said, pointing up to the tree by the edge of the eight-foot-high wooden fence. A balloon was stuck in the top branches, the top branch. I'd wait for a breeze to blow it off, but there hasn't been a breeze for days. Fernando climbed the tree. He was just a few inches from knocking, from knocking free the balloon when he glanced into the window of Gil Dover's house next door. Looks like a robbery, he yelled down. Broken window. A big mess. Tony... Tony, my phone's not working. Go to the corner and call 911. I'll meet you near Gill's rear gate. Okay. When the police arrived, Tony and Fernando were waiting outside the splintered gate to Gil Dover's backyard. Uh, that's how we found it, Fernando explained. We didn't go in. Upon entering, the police found that Fernando had said... Oh. Oh, wait a minute. Upon entering, the police found what Fernando had said. A broken window, a big mess in the den, plus ten missing rare coins worth $100,000. Gildover wasn't too disturbed. The, the coins were insured, he reported. My uncle left me the collection, and frankly, I'd rather have the money. I usually put the alarm on, but today's cleaning day. I don't put it on when the house cleaner comes. But the cleaner never... But the... But the cleaner had never come. Al of Al's domestic services was at his own house across town. He said he got a message from the answering service asking him to skip this week. A sergeant checked his notes. Dover said he left home at his usual time, 11 a.m. Fernando looked over the fence at 11.30. Anyone could have broken in during the half-hour period. Maybe, the captain replied, but I have a good idea who's responsible, who done it, and how. Uh, it's on page 329. Let's see. So, I don't know anything about this one. Uh, party over. The captain noticed that Fernando's balloons had been on the lawn, indicating that they had been... Oh. I think I see it now. But anyways. The captain noticed that Fernando's balloons had been on the lawn, indicating that they had been blown up with regular air, not helium, and yet on a windless day, there was one balloon stuck high in the tree. The captain could only conclude that Fernando had planted it there. When Fernando climbed the tree and glanced over to the fence, he saw no evidence of a robbery. He actually committed the crime later while his friend went down the street to place the 911 call. That makes sense. And we have time for one more, I think. Um, uh, okay. The smuggler, and, the smuggler and the Clever Wife. A Mexican border guard was talking to his wife over the cellular phone when he accidentally pulled in a fragment of static-filled conversation between a man and a woman. I'll be waiting in... Tecate, at noon, for your regular Monday shipment, said the man. You don't think the border guards are getting wise? No, the woman laughed. We can keep this operated, operation going forever. And then, just as suddenly as they'd come, the voices disappeared. For a full month, customs officials kept track of the traffic at the relatively quiet border crossing. Only three women made a regular habit of crossing into Mexico each Monday morning. The first woman, impeccably dressed, drove a black Mercedes. 
the second girl, barely out of her teens, always crossed on an old red bicycle. The third drove a small van. Mexico Spa was on the side in fancy letters. Of, of the three, she was the only one declaring merchandise. A weekly supply of U.S.-made health foods and vitamins on which she paid a hefty tariff. On the fifth Monday, they detained all three women. Methodically, they searched, tearing each panel from the dark blue Mercedes, even checking inside the tire tubes. They did the same with the bicycle. Searching the van took the most time. Luckily, this week's shipment of health food was smaller than usual. The officers took samples from each box and bottle. After finally allowing the women into Mexico, the guard who had intercepted the conversation got back on his cellular phone and reported every detail of the fiasco to his wife. From what you say, dear, I think I know who it is. When the woman I suspect crosses back into the U.S., ask passport control to detain her. In my, if my theory is correct, it will be obvious what she is smuggling and how she's doing it. She explained her theory, leaving the guard to marvel at the brilliant woman he'd married. Who, who's the smuggler? What is she smuggling? And how? Okay, 337. I do know this one. Because I, I, I remember reading this one recently. Because this one was fascinating. Okay, it says here. The guard's wife caught the one discrepancy no one else did. The Mercedes woman had used a different colored car. Not black this time, but dark blue. Could the woman be driving a different car on each trip across the border? It was worth checking out. Later, oh no, late that same afternoon, when passport control stopped the woman from re-entering the U.S., they found her dressed more much more casual. They also found her taking the bus. It was no, no simple. Oh, it was so simple that no one had seen it. The woman was smuggling cars, a whole fleet of stolen Mercedes. And we are going to end it right there. And um, we will be continuing the series until it's done. Every other day, as per usual. Uh, I'm not sure when this is going to go up. I'll have to check my notes. But anyways, if you like this content, make sure you like and subscribe and ring the bell so you know when I upload. And if you want to support me in any way, all that information will be in the description below. And as always, thanks for watching everyone, and have a great day.